HMP Swinfen Hall, home to more than 600 young men, the majority violent offenders, from robbery to murder. They're trying a new approach here, a mother bereaved by exactly such violence, forcing the men to first confront what they've done. The hardest thing I will have to do in my entire life is kiss my little boy for the very last time. Sorry is not enough in a way. I understand that I've caused a lot of damage to people's families. It does make me think a lot about my victim. A governor determined to convince them that there is still time to change. Despite the crimes that some of the prisoners have committed here, there is hope for the future. 80% of the men are here for serious violent offences and the violence doesn't end once they're locked inside. Successive inspection reports talk about worrying levels of violence in the prison. Yet the governor wants to talk only about keeping the peace. I think often the prisoners here at Swinford Hall have, have been used to the term violence for probably most of their lives, lived in a world of violence for often much of their lives. And I think a change of narrative and talking about how can we keep the peace is just much more of a different way of looking at the same problem, but in a more positive narrative. He says the young men bring into jail old gang associations and postcode wars and long-held habits of being obliged to respond to the tiniest of slights with dangerous aggression. Humiliation is the nuclear bomb of conflict. And my view is that often conflict within prisons is as a result of a quick-witted remark or a disrespectful statement to somebody that creates public humiliation that often escalates into violent situations. Part of his strategy is to get them to face up to the consequences of that violence. After my son's 18th birthday, Joshua was murdered. Alison Cope's son was killed by a single stab wound nine years ago. She tells her story without sugarcoating. God, what I would give to visit my son, to have an hour with him, to hold him for one last time, to talk to him, but I will never, ever have that again because there's my little boy now cremated, dead for what? A hard question for young men who've also carried knives and used them to hurt people. Tell me a little bit about what you felt when you watched Alison's talk. A bit of reality hit to me. He's never going to be coming back to you. Like, when you're in here, you're around people that have done it, like all the crimes, and they don't get talked about, about the victim side of the family and the victim in there. But when actually people from situations come in, like victims, it, it hits you more. A lot of the times people talk about knife crime or something like that and they'll be like wearing a suit in an office or something and that's not relatable because what do they know about knife crimes, you know what I'm saying? Whereas she actually knows something about it, she's got personal experience with it. At the time, did you think, who did you think about, what did you think about? At the time you don't think about it, at all I don't think because it's a sort of a, adrenaline kicks in, fight or flight kicks in, stuff like that, but... Um, I don't even think afterwards you really think about victims until something like this happens and then it opens your eyes to it. Because I take part in a, a behaviour programme as well at the moment. So I'm thinking about my victims, I'm thinking about the consequences of my actions, but I never really did that before. When you're thinking about getting released, all you're going back to is what you know. So if you don't learn in here, you're not going to learn out there. Like, you're not going to change out there. It depends how much you really want to do change. So, yeah. And what about you? No, 100% I do. But confronting the past is only the beginning. She wants them also to work on making sure their future is different. This isn't an easy process and there are victims, there are victims' families that are left, are left with a life sentence of pain, trauma, and their lives are ruined forever. And we can't just go, oh, OK, we've well, done this now, move forward, forgive yourself. It's not as simple as that, but we have to start somewhere. If you've just been sentenced to life, um, it's probably very, very difficult to see, well, actually, there is a future. And the last thing we want is for them to continue their behaviour, continue that such negative outlook on life and hurt someone else. But while the men feel they are changing, they also know they go back into a world which may not have changed with them. When I'm back out, it's going to be a time and there's going to be a place where I will see them. And I don't know how they'll react. I know I'll react in a calm manner, but it's how they'll come across to me. I can walk away instead of picking up a knife or starting an argument. I think the best thing for me to do is just to call off before approaching that again.
breaking the cycle of violence that so many of the men have lived with, some born into, will be key to the success of the Keeping the Peace strategy. Joshua's own life had spiralled after his father went to prison for murder, though Josh had begun to turn his life around when he was killed. But that part of the story clearly hit home for some of the young men, now fathers in prison themselves. When I was younger, my father wasn't really about, so I feel like Alison saying that maybe have had an impact on me. I don't really want that for my son and for him to grow up like that, so it's made me want to become a better man whilst I'm in prison. And you talked about your son. Yeah. What, what has that... You, you've been forced to confront that. The, yeah. You know, that by, by doing what you did, you've ended up in here and you're not in his life. What does that mean to you now? That hit me hard. It probably hit me hardest out of everything because, like I was saying, I basically seen him grow up in pictures. I never, I've not been there for one birthday. So it is hard. And when I see him on a visit, he just, he's looking older and bigger every time. So it just it hurts. I just think that I feel like a waste of time in a way, you know what I'm saying? So that, that's what I think is motivating me more than anything right now. You'll know. Some people within the public sphere, the political sphere, may say this sounds like an easy option. It sounds like a, a soft option for these men. I would say that rehabilitation is really, really hard work. To be truly rehabilitative as a person, you've got to be able to give people a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance and a fifth chance. And doing that is really difficult some days. Um, and it's really difficult for prisoners because um, they come from a background of perhaps very negative learned behaviour and to change that I think is a really difficult thing. Rehabilitation is not the easy route, rehabilitation is a really tough route for, for many people. Now thank you everyone for being so respectful. There is a practical reason why Alison Cope does all of this. Her hope that it will mean fewer devastated victims. But there is also something less obvious but no less powerful, driving her to do it. When a child dies, the love for that child, it doesn't stop, it continues. And I think with Joshua, my love has just been channeled and it's been channeled to other people. And I think that's really helped me in a way because I'm not just left in limbo, consumed with all these emotions and not knowing what to do with them. I'm very fortunate that my love for Josh can still be given out, not to Josh, but to others. Well, joining me now is former prison, prison governor and current director of the Prison Reform Trust, Peter Dawson. Peter Dawson, how unique an approach is this? Well, it's not unique, but it's certainly not common, and it's a hugely impressive programme. Uh, of course, it's the sort of work that hasn't been happening in prisons for two years during COVID and is put at risk by staff shortages now. But what a tribute to Alison and what a tribute to the governor to bring that into his prison to try and make the difference. And that impact of COVID is still ongoing. I mean, we still hear about prisoners locked up in cells for longer, the ongoing staff shortages. I mean, what more can be done to address that apart from the obvious, which is resources? Well, many of the young men that you've seen in that fantastic film are serving incredibly long sentences. They are serving sentences that will keep them in prison for longer than they've been alive. That's, that's a big difference in our system. We didn't used to be so punitive. So that's inflated the prison population. But, but this, this is about people coming to terms with something which the system hides. And if you think about what happens during a trial, actually, a prisoner may be pleading not guilty. Even if they plead guilty, then the brief that their attorney is given is to minimise the offence, to try and get the shortest sentence possible. So it's actually in prison where the grief and the remorse and the shame and the guilt have to be confronted. Very often people will not have told the truth to their family. And a programme like this, confronted with the courage that someone like Alison is showing, means not only that you have to be truthful to yourself, but you've got to be truthful to the people around you. And, and that is the start of a process which can put a life back on track. Mm. What would you say to those who believe that prisons should be about punishment, not some form of therapy? Well, prison is always about punishment. And, and it's not really about the physical conditions. It's about the 
the mental suffering that people go through. And I'm not asking for pity for that. I think the, the loss of liberty is the punishment and that's how, we, that's how we deal with the awful things that many of these young men have done. But, but what you have to understand about that experience is what happens in the cell in the middle of the night when you're on your own. What happens when you arrive from court? Maybe in court you've been full of bravado, wanting to show your family that you're going to be all right. But when you arrive in the prison and you could be looking at decades of your life inside, in which you won't see your children grow up, in which people close to you will die, in which people who you thought were your friends will move away and will lose touch with you. That's the suffering of imprisonment. And we know the research shows us that it runs very deep indeed.